so this roundtable, as well as other activities related to simulation at CAA, are partially funded by Software Sustainability Institute, of which I am a fellow. And I have some nice stickers and leaflets to give to all of you. And they're really cool, and you can make your, your laptop very, very nerdy. And Software Sustainability Institute, it was set up to promote best practice in uh, soft research software development. And you may be surprised, but with everything we do, so simulation is software, and a modeler is a research software developer. So the problems of the research software developers community are our problems. And I don't think we face them very well yet, because A, there aren't that many of us, and B, you know, we all also have second specialization. We're all, uh, you know, an archaeologist of Roman provinces or lower Paleolithic. So there's a way out of it for us. However, this will be bigger and bigger issue, and I think we start, should start engaging with it. So a few lessons that we can learn from from research software development and from uh, simulation in general. So, for example, let's start with tools for code, de code, code development. You can either use simulation platforms, such as NetLogo, Repass, or Mason. And this is a great solution because it's an, an integrated environment, so it removes a lot of overheads. You don't have to code, say, the screen on which your simulation runs. And it's very easy to develop those models because everything you may, know, may, may want is already there until you come to a place where it isn't. <laughs> and then it gets so difficult that you regret that you haven't done it differently. However, those are not big languages, which means that the community and the support is limited to the number of users. Uh, and it also doesn't give you transferable skills. So it's nice to say I can do simulations, but it's less impressive to say I can do NetLogo than if you say I can do Java, because Java is actually a transferable skill. So the alternative is to write from scratch in real computing languages. And it does have a better support because there are hundreds and thousands of people using Python on a daily basis. And they, they do it in all sorts of uh, scenarios. And if you have a question, somebody probably already asked this question online and answered it. And it's unlikely that you won't be able to find the answer for your question somewhere online. And however, at the same time, it's a much longer and much more painful process to develop your code. Having said that, you have a much higher level of control over what is going on in the code because you know exactly how things are coded and how it's all developed. So there is a bit of a balance to be struck between the two. I'm not going to tell you which one's better. You have to choose for yourself. So once you finish coding, well, congratulations, you're 40% done. Yes. So everyone thinks, oh, yeah, I just I finished coding. You know, the, the work's done. Well, actually, no. Testing is, is a big topic, and it usually takes way more time than actually coding the simulation. And there are many different methods for that that were developed for computer science that we can just use because they are, are out there, and it's much easier to pick up the tools that are already available than create the new ones. So you can use passive method, methods, such as assertive testing or, or test-driven dri development, which are well described in the computer science literature. You can use active methods. I think the one that everyone uses for NetLogo is just looking at it mm -hmm. and seeing if it looks reasonable. It is not great, but it is a way of debugging the code. Um, there are other ones, and there are so many tools out there to make it easy <laughs> that it's pretty shocking that we're not using them more. So every piece of software needs documentation, and that should include inline comments for which you will you will thank yourself in the very near future when you read your code and you're like, what the heck is A? And A could be probably anything and never call anything A or X. <laughs> so putting comments everywhere will help you, will help people that will read the code later. Um, for agent-based models, we use the ODD standard for description of the models and that's extremely useful for people to understand what were your intentions. Because the code may be correct in the sense that there's no technical errors, but it may not represent what you think it represents, which is not great. It's really easy to get a DOI for things, and you should get one for your simulation because that makes it easy to cite it. And the simulation is a research output, just like a paper is a research output. And it's very important that we start thinking about people getting credit for those. Because 
At some point you may find yourself developing simulations for years and writing less papers, which means that you're going to be disadvantaged compared to your colleagues that just bang on papers. So DOI, uh, add an about file, put the ODD there, add a license file. Uh, the ones that we are probably be using is the CC400 and the MIT one. Uh, they are you know, reused for non-commercial purposes, but with attribution. So people that use your, um, your, your simulation or any part of it should always cite it and should always give you the credit. Uh, make it open access. I don't think I have to even talk about it because it's so obvious. And the credit and attribution thing is, is very important. And uh, very recently, uh, I went to a hack day and created a tool that allows you to figure out if you should cite software. And that actually applies to any research software. So if you are a GIS person or, or somebody that does uh, statistics, that still applies. So if the software asks you to cite it, you have to cite it. It's like when people say, oh, you can use my uh, image, but you have, to, you have to say where it's from, you do it. The same for software. Um, and if it plays any critical role in your, in your, kind of, in your, re in your result, you have to cite it as well so that people can reproduce it. And finally, if, uh, if, that's, if that, those are not the case, you could, should still cite it if the people there, they depend on, on uh, academic funding because they have to show the impact of what they did. And you can just as well cite them so that they get more money to do it. So yeah, those were the few lessons from software development. Do you have any questions about that? That was a bit of a do this. <laughs> so I, I just want to see like how many people I'll just, I'll, yeah. how many people actually cite software that you use? ArcMap, SPSS. Yes. Yes, we are the best community ever then. Because when you think about it, we use a lot of different types of software. I mean, I just use Prezi to show it to you, but I don't cite Prezi for goodness sake. Um, you know, so, so it's quite it's sometimes tricky to know which one to cite. Caesar, you had a question. Yeah, yeah um, very quickly. In your experience, what are the dominant uh, approaches to building software in archaeology? So, what kind of in methodology, what kind of approach mm -hmm. do people use in order to go from a vague idea to a piece of code that works? Hopefully? I noticed that archaeology seems to be, well, A, agent based modeling is the preferred tool almost exclusively. However, there are pockets of specific topics that are actually not using agent-based modeling at all. Which, for example, if you're looking at the Neolithic dispersal, the, the dispersal of, the, of Neolithic, 90% of uh, models, except for very very recent one, are uh, actually uh, the equation that Elizabeth showed. And so it's interesting that the, it's topic-specific rather than, and not even research question specific, but topic specific. So agent-based modeling is used very widely. And then for example, for things related to cultural transmission, it's almost exclusively uh, equation-based modeling. So it almost kind of feels like there was the first person and they did something and now everyone's kind of does the same thing, but kind of goes on with it. And for agent-based modeling, it's mostly NetLogo. For equation-based stuff, it's mostly MATLAB and R. I think there's a lot of development in R because it's open source, it's a relatively easy language to learn and there is a lot... What's on the C0? <laughs> there, there is a lot of online documentation and you can create a package in R that other people can download. So one of um, our colleagues from the lab in Washington State, Andrea spent some time with us up there, has been developing models for doing um, Paleoclimate reconstruction. And right now, it is the code, if you just start the code and run it, is specific to the United States, but you give it a window and you say, use this data, these climate models, and it will take climate models from the last thousands of years and will give you an output of that reconstruction. And so the paper's out there and you can do it, but he's working on making that more available worldwide. So for those who work in Europe or Asia, but those are all in R, and there are a lot of people um, in the United States who are really working on making things accessible, free, and um, easy to read. Yeah. yeah. Chami, what do you use for, for your models? Uh, it's the same. I mean, I started with C++, but then, I mean, if you, if you have a very 
uh, a complicated model, then you need something quick, uh, and C++ and then this field is way better than the rest. But then, I'm, I mean, I always program from scratch, so I use Python and R. It depends on the, on the problem. And, uh, every language is fitted for a particular set of problems. And uh, the only one I'm not using is Netlogo. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I think there's a qualitative difference between Netlogo and the rest, because the rest are, uh, let's say, you can do everything you want with the other ones. So they are not, you can do the analysis with the other ones. With that, Netlog is not the same. It's a very narrow package for a very particular thing. Uh, so th my, my question is, OK, but when you have the model, you run it, and then you explore it, and you analyze it. If you use Netlog, you need to use another platform, right? Or what, what's people doing with this? Uh, is it just using basic statistics, or then you go Oh, no, you, you output the result and then analyze it in whatever, Excel, SPSS, R. Mm -hmm. So it's not done within Netlogo. I mean, you can have some stuff that kind of calculates itself as you go, but yeah, the results are outputted into the text file. The cool thing of learning Python and R is that you can do the model class analysis in the same platform. So in some ways, it's a, let's say, easier solution. But still doing an agent with more in R is challenging, say, because it's not designed for that. There is the R and NetLogo interface, and so yeah. you can code in R and it will run in that logo and spit everything back out in R, which is pretty rad. But still, it's not the same right. language in the sense of the uh, same syntax. Sure. And if you use Python, then you can yeah. do your maps, you know, scripted in Python, because ArcMap and QGIS work in Python. You can write your simulation and run, the, run on those maps, and then you can analyze the results all in one language. Win. Total win. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can write your unit testing. But the, the Python for this is not, I don't think it's a Python, uh, native Python. There's keywords. So in, the, in the which one? By S3. Oh, yeah, sure. But, so, you know, at the end of the day, you still use, you know, a lot of Python syntax. So, so I just mean you don't switch cognitively to another language. No, no, but you can not transfer directly. But uh, Python offers a lot of li library, a uh, Joe, um, mm -hmm. Joe special library like uh, GDAO or Shipley or Matplotlib that can be useful yeah. and you can store uh, your, your data in PostGIS mm -hmm. quite easily. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a balance of like how long do you want to spend developing stuff versus how sure you have to be about results. So I think the more complex your simulation, the, the quicker you should move on to scripting languages. I would say this. I think other people would disagree, but we don't have any more time for this topic to discuss because we need the next person.